No problem. We're I got it. We're good. And we're live. So Hey everybody, welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips. Sorry for the late start this morning. Uh, it was just a weird morning. <laughs> Things delayed. I thought the stream was launched. I left to do my little run to the restroom. I came back. The stream wasn't launched. You know, things like that. Technical difficulties and technical difficulties. Speaking of which, hello and welcome back. This is me, your host, Anne, and Disembodied Voice Justin is temporarily dis, uh, dis disembodied uh, as he is uh, driving home real quick. So he has stuff to do. He has to do this afternoon, so he is not going to be riding herd on us today. We are, we are sans disembodied voice. Hello, hello. It's a day. It's already kind of a day, guys. Wednesday's good, though. Wednesday is generally good because I have all afternoon to get Patreon stuff done, and that's nice. I like having that. I like having that huge block of time. Don't you ever like that in the middle of the afternoon when you actually have like no meetings, no no weirdness, no no in my case no streaming, and you could just like put your head down for like three or four hours and just shovel through stuff. I, I really like those days. I like those days. Yes, hello everybody. Hello, 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 hello. Boom from Mo. Yeah, boom. That's how I feel. I feel boomed pretty much this morning. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're halfway through the week. I know it's going to be the weekend. Where is January gone, guys? Like, like, I started a meditation habit so that I could, like, get more mindful, but my mindfulness apparently only extends to, like, the 10 minutes that I sit and stare at the pretty fountain, and then the rest of the time just goes, wee! Yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm trying to do the meditation in Ara. I'm trying to get more conscious of time passage so that I can use it more effectively. Because that's half the battle, right? If you just get distracted and you just tend to let things slip, then, you know, you can't really, you know, it's hard to utilize things very well. It, if you're trying to do, like, um, there's a thing called time chunking. If you're trying, I'm trying to kind of, like, try to do that to be more efficient. It's an efficiency practice. But it's really hard to do it without mindfulness. Like, you have to, like, you know, kind of pay attention. Coffee break. Hi. Hi, Rob and Julie. How's it going? So you're staring at snow. Snow is very blinding when it's sunny. Here we had we had actual thunderstorm last night here in South Bay. Hey, miniatures den. Hi, Luca. I was just looking at what you were painting. The lady who is all blue except for her tummy. <laughs> tummy and chest, I guess. She looks really good though. I love the skin tones. Actually, it's really bronzed looking and really like healthy and sunshine like looking. I really like it. I'm like I need to spend more time watching Luca stream. <laughs> Hello. Hey, let's go to actual mini cams. You guys don't have to stare at my face. How about that? Yay. Hey, everybody. I'm Anne. I work for Reaper Miniatures. These days, I work for Reaper Miniatures remotely. Um, if you've been in on a previous Luca raid, you know. Uh, you, you've seen me before. Uh, but yeah, so I paint. I paint stuff. And today, we're painting stuff. <laughs> we're painting a cat folk rogue. Yes. Yeah, the kitty is coming along. She's really, uh, she's, she's looking cool since we blocked in all of her armor last time. Um... <laughs> you tend to for forget the first half of the month. Yeah, we were just talking about how January is almost over, like WTF. Like, what is going on? <laughs> the month is just, like, flying. But yes, hello, hello, Raiders. So I'm Anne. Um, what I did, I was staff painter at Reaper Miniatures for many years. I also created the Master Series paint line, which is the line that I use on the show all the time. Because if you get to actually create your own paint line, you darn well better use it, <laughs> in my opinion. 
So yes, we uh, we talk a lot about Master Series. We talk about paint chemistry, color theory, and we paint things. That's what we do here. It's a pretty chill stream. I am not a crazy outrageous person, or at least I'm not a crazy outrageous person on stream. Who knows in private? Um, but uh, yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, it's a different, it's a different beast, isn't it, Luca? Right? They're very, very different. The body is very, very different. The base is very different. Chemically, it's extremely different from what most other mini choice companies are using these days, right? So, but I, I personally do a lot of things with really thin paint and transparency and glazes. So that's kind of, I think if you, if you have somebody create a paint line that is a painter, that you're going to see come out kind of their style. Yeah, yeah, I do that too. I, I mix it with actually I like Scale Seventy Five Tube, so yeah, Artist Series, so it's tube paint. So I but I find mixing them is very very nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean they're really heavily pigmented. It's it's like people are like, oh, they don't cover. They must not have pigment. It's like that's one of the biggest paint myths out there, like in the world. Like clear magenta, is is a color that is totally see through, but it has more pigment in it. It's in the top five paints of as far as how much pigment in it it has in it, and you know, as far as the Reaper brands. So like, hey, thank you for thank you for the gifted sub, mistress. But uh, you were gonna sub yourself. Oh no! And now you were beaten to it. <laughs> oh dear, 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 dear. Yeah, but yeah. So I'm glad you're liking them. Uh, just keep playing, keep playing with them. Like, uh, obviously, I'm not in charge anymore. Like, I I created all of the paints up through the Pathfinder line. And then uh, a year ago when I moved, you know, Sadie, my uh, my second in command took over. So now it's all Sadie at the helm. All the new, any new colors that come out from this point on are not me, except for the Kickstarter ones. I did make those. Uh. <laughs> That's right. The paint mistress owns his soul. <laughs> I just love it when, um, let me get in focus on, on Shadow Eyes here so we can actually get some paint on this figure. Uh, yeah, that's really, really nice. Focus. Focus. We get really close on the kitty. Close on the kitty. There she is. Um, but yeah, hi, dragon. Uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Like, I, I honestly sometimes wonder what, like, various miniature painters would do. Like, like if, if um, I don't know, like if you or if, uh, well, if Kirill or... Actually, if Kirill made a paint line, I'd expect it to be kind of like mine because he really likes Master Series. But, you know, if any, if some of these big name painters would actually have the opportunity, like if Matt Pietro was going to walk out and create a paint line, what would he do, right? You know, like it's, it, it's just an interesting question to me since I got to like kind of create the paint line I always dreamed of. But uh, yeah, I'm always tickled when, when uh, painters who I admire uh, really embrace the paint line. So thank you, Luca. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, Chimera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Chimera is a paint line that comes from painters. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And they're, they do, you know, they're doing the very heavily pigmented and the clears and all that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or what we call clears, they call single pigment. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, and you can tell, right? You can tell when a paint line is created, I think, by painters who are engaged with the hobby. Um, yes. All brands have a use for every, exactly, exactly. Like people don't know like why, <laughs> like, like uh, Master Series is on the opposite end of the spectrum from this, right? Which is, this is the other paint line that I really like that's currently existing. Um, but I like them kind of for a couple combo of reasons that they have, um, the finish on those is the same as Master Series. So I feel like using them together, it works really well. It synergizes really well for me. Um, and two, I come from a 2D art background. So it's, you know, it's raw sienna. It's all the colors I grew up with using, um, on canvas. So I like that sometimes because I know exactly what I'm dealing with, uh, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, and it also, but, but it also depends on your style, right, Luca? Cause it's like, um, like for me, I, I do find it's harder to work with these for like, you know, for filtering, for glazing, for thinned applications. But of course, then I have Master Series, right? Yeah. So when you need thicker paint or a higher coverage off the bat, you go to the one side and then, yeah. But I tend to use Master Series for everything because I'm just so used to it. But yeah, the other paint line, when I use another paint line. I haven't uh, gotten my hands on the Chimera colors. I played with them a little bit in one of my paint classes and Rhonda uh, let me play with them a little bit. These days, though, coming from the direction that I come from with paint, uh, with paint chemistry, um, all I have to do is use a paint line and I know what they're using. Like as far as, as like just 
the the body and the way it acts I, even the smell of it like all i have to do is smell it i can tell you what they're probably using for resins like it's it's kind of weird um to come at it from this vantage point so so yeah it's 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 really interesting yeah yeah exactly yeah that's what I, what I really, what my thing is, is finish, right? Because I want that specific, like, matte, but not dead matte finish. And and so Reaper is formulated with that kind of, like, almost eggshell, what, the, what we call in America an eggshell finish, which is between satin and dead matte. Um, and it's hard to find another paint line that has that finish. Like, many paint lines I just find are too glossy for me. If I'm going to use them, I have to add our anti-shine additive, cut them a little bit. But, uh, but yeah. But, yeah, Cool. Yeah, weird demo, right? Well, I have the weirdest superpowers. <laughs> My paint superpowers are really odd, guys. Really odd. All right, so let, what are we going to work on? Let's work on fur. I want to give her stripes on her tail. I want to finish out the paws. I want to actually highlight and shade some more fur. Uh, her front end is looking really good on the fur, uh, but I need to work on her toes. Then we can work on uh, bringing up some leather uh, and like like the leather here, and we'll do all that. And her armors. Then we'll kind of adjust her armor. We haven't done our our medals, our NMMs yet. Uh, that'll be the last. But yeah, 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 Flixer. It it would be a very odd. I if I if we had a paint superpower competition at some convention where all the painters got up and showed their paint superpower and mine was just step up to random bottles of paint, sniff them, and pronounce like this is the properties this paint has. Just I'm guessing, but I bet you I'm right. <laughs> I would have the weirdest paint superpower. All right, sit down, shadow eyes. Sit down, stay. All right, let's see here. We were using russet brown. My favorite which is actually talking of artist colors if you ever want a burnt umber this is your baby um i i really wanted a burnt umber but we could not find any like uh pigment in the lines that we were using any company that actually produced a burnt umber pigment um and there's a reason for that i guess uh there's there's i could go on i could go on about why the reason is but well actually okay the reason is that these days even the artist paint companies usually aren't using actual burnt umber usually they're using brown oxide and and the paint companies that we were using we're using a brown oxide. It was just a different color because it had a different, like it had, a, it was a different, um, like chemical. There's a whole bunch of brown umbers and they're all a little bit different and it depends on how they're creating them. Um, so stuff like that. Paint sommelier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So essentially what it comes down to is that, um, uh, I could, I could create a brown umber without it being actual, like, like a burnt umber. Um, without it being actually burnt umber. And the, the problem is that even artist paint companies now are switching away from those original artist pigments because they're just too bloody expensive. And they're going for cheaper stuff and they're calling it burnt umber hue. Um, and they, that was always done like when they were trying to make a cheaper version. But now industrial pigments have gotten so very good that uh, and, and also everybody's trying to switch away from toxic pigments and very high price pigments. So you can still get real burnt umber, but it's going to cost you. And most burnt umbers these days are mixtures. So when I realized that I knew that I could mix my own burnt umber and have it, it would work just fine. So yeah, paint smelly, but for smell. I do not taste paint. You cannot trust paint companies to use non-toxic ingredients, guys. It says non-toxic, but that's usage-based. It does not mean you can eat it, okay? It's not food grade. Non-toxic does not equal food grade. Got it? <laughs> I say this, and you might think it's stupid that I say this, but people are just not very logical sometimes. <laughs> All right, and then what do we have? Uh, we have brown liner because I like a little more fluidity in my paint when I was dealing with fur. So we we're doing with, let's back up a bit. We're getting really close on the kitty and that means we're not getting our paint in frame. Um, and then we had a little bit of harvest brown. No, it's not. It's just more expensive to make Pendrake. Like, cause you have to take umber pigment, actual umber pigment and then heat it. Um, yeah. So many brush liquor. I know Polaris, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I could say it crazy. <laughs> But yeah, so it's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a large movement away from, from toxic pigments, um, just in the general, like art world, right? As long as you, as long as they can make something that's archival quality, that is the right hue that acts the right way. It has the same coverage has this versus transparency. It has the same finish. It has the same kind of qualities. You can mix it effectively like the old version. Then there's no reason not to do a non-toxic version that's cheaper. I mean, why wouldn't you? Right? So it does make it interesting for those of us who create paint lines where we're like, well, I want to make this color, but I can't get a hold of the pigment anymore. Like, like what happens if they stop making queen of credone violet or magenta and like what happens to our magentas then? I don't know. 
luckily Queen of Credone is actually cheaper. It's not super cheap, but it's it's not super expensive either. So I, that's unlikely. Just like the Thalo greens are always going to be around. The Thalo blues always going to be around. The oxides are always going to be around. There's just certain things. <laughs> yeah, it keeps you from being a brush licker. Yep. I, you, should, you shouldn't be a brush licker. I mean, I, I broke myself of the hobby ages ago. And now if I forget, if for some reason my hands are occupied and I and I can't do what I've trained myself to do, um, then, and I, and the brush even goes toward my mouth. It just feels weird. So I, I short circuited that process guys by essentially when I, after I dip my brush in the water, I take it up and I squeeze it, I squeeze it through my hand. So I got to the point where I did that instead makes a perfectly sharp point. I no longer need to worry about brush licking. Ta-da. And you can see the water right there. So, so that's the habit I taught myself is that move to get around, uh, brush licking. And it was an effective, uh, effective habit. So, all right, so what the colors we're mixing here. And what this is is pigment interaction. Because you might look at these and you might think that brown liner, which has a lot of black in it and also some yellow and red to make brown, um, and harvest brown, which is orange, you would think that these colors together probably would make something close to this. And you'd kind of be right. But the reason you want the russet brown in there is because of the pigment, the actual pigments that are in it. If you mix these two together, what's going to happen is you're going to get a little bit greenish, like not a ton greenish, but it's going to have a slight shift. It's not going to be this warm, warm brown. And the reason is that this has such a huge front load of yellow pigment. Since, of course, I made it, I know that. You can kind of tell, though, when you get that intense orange brown, you're almost always dealing with a warm yellow pigment, a, a orange shade yellow. Um, and then you can see that this has to have a lot of black in it because it's almost, it is almost black itself. So when you mix yellow and black, you get green. So the way to short circuit that though, is to add in oxide pigments, which I keep referring to, but it's like yellow oxide, which is like yellow ochre, um, and red oxide, which is like a rust color and brown oxide, which is a darker brown or rust color, right? Cause it's iron oxide. Um, and when you add oxides in, they interact also with black, but they interact in the direction of red. So essentially what happens is you cancel out those colors and you end up with a nice warm brown. I could just use russet, but I wanted something a little more muted. So I've just played around a little bit and uh, wanted something that was a little bit off of this. This is, this is a really intense color and it's a little too red for what I wanted for her fur. So yeah, you know, stuff like that. Orchid purple is the best, yes. Orchid purple is the best, and you all have to buy 60 tons of it, and also rich indigo and black indigo. Remember, we use that a lot. Um, good colors. Good Kickstarter colors. Last bit. The, they're my last gasp, guys. you got to buy them so they stay in print. It's my one request. <laughs> all right, so I'm just going to mix these one to one to one and get something that's close. I didn't make a note. Um, I always keep a little sticky note to tell me what colors I've, I've used on anything if I feel like I need a reminder. If it's a particular weird um, ratio, then I make a note of that. But since I didn't, I'm just going to mix them together. Oh, sure. Um, clover, because uh, paint formulas are highly protected, are usually pretty protected info. They're proprietary info. Um, we don't share our formulas with anyone. So I don't, I, I give generalities, but... Think of it also this way is like, this is like pretty specialized knowledge and even paint companies like artist paint companies don't tell you this stuff. Like, so it's like, if you fill up, like it's, it's weird to kind of cross between like Reaper wants its formulas to stay proprietary. And in order to even understand what I'm talking about, you have to have the background, right? So you would be better off doing what I'm doing and doing just doing general information or just giving people the, the color information and then doing the more intense stuff, you know, on a separate platform, in my opinion. Like if, if I, if I had said that to anybody who like, didn't like, I don't know, like the majority of new people in the hobby, they would have run screaming. Like there is such a thing as too much information for a newbie. Yeah. Um, Palomino Gold is sagebrush. Exactly what Polaris said. I actually talked about that. When did I talk about that? Recently. Yeah, it's info overload, right? Because, I mean, think about all of the new people to the hobby who just, like, see a color wheel and run away. 
and the color wheel is like the most most happy little inoffensive piece of of art color theory thing ever right so then you start talking about pigment interactions they're gonna freak out i mean they are i've seen it guys i've been teaching this and talking about this for like almost 20 years at this point trust me on this so there is a there is such a thing as like necessary information like this is a very orangey brown so you should treat it like an orange on your model and when you're mixing with it you know and since it's so intense it has a lot of yellow in it you know like orange does orange is mostly yellow with just a little bit of red you know but even that even that gets people like like that so you gotta have the interest yeah the blank stare yes and the loud sound of their brain cracking exactly right right ah so luca knows so there so it, it's like you wish you had this information maybe but your average person coming into the hobby doesn't and so Reaper is in the business of just teaching, I think Reaper even more than a lot of other companies, a lot of people that come to this hobby to, uh, through us are very new. And so we have a lot of products that are geared toward just easing people into this, right? Our Learn to Paint kits that are um, excellently written um, and done by Rhonda, Rhonda Bender, Bird with a Brush. Uh, she has an awesome blog. Um uh, though that's an that's an, an example. Like Learn to Paint Kit One is so basic, guys, but we sell the pants off of that thing. Like, just and and even Learn to Paint Kit Two, we sell a ton of, and that's the layering ones. So that's a little more intimidating, right? But that's like uh kind of Reaper. Reaper's a good gateway drug, is what I'm trying to say to the hobby. So we try not to overload with information. If people come to my channel here and they decide they do want more of this stuff, you can come over to the Patreon. And I do stuff over there that's a little bit more keyed toward that. Um, but, you know, but Reaper doesn't want to throw a whole bunch of paint co color theory and paint chemistry up on its website. I mean, there's just no reason for it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, they're in the paint. So, yeah, we're focused. Thanks for the, the Patreon link, Nomad Zeke. There's my Patreon, patreon.com slash painting big. If you're into, like, just, like, kind of dissecting the color stuff and looking for uses for it and, you know, just kind of like seeing me talk about paint color and coverage and color theory and all that kind of thing, the $5 tier is your good tier. That is where I, I usually talk about color. All right, I want one other thing, creamy ivory. Where is my beautiful creamy ivory? There it is. I've been so good at putting my paint, I have a new organized setup, so I've been being so good about putting my paints back in the drawer in an organized manner. So I'm very pleased about that. All right, and we're going to get a little bit of this creamy ivory mix. And pretty much my lighter colors are my creamy ivory, which is a beautiful kind of cream, like warm cream color. It's a good off-white. Excellent off-white if you want softer effects um, with just a brush full of our base fur color. And this gives us essentially a little bit of a grayed out cream because there is so much black because of the brown liner. But that's the color that we were originally working with. So, so I guessed right on my, uh, my paint layout. When I put down on my little cheat sheets that it's this color, this color, and this color, that essentially means it's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. Good. Excellent, Trouble. That's, that's the best thing. Like, cause I ain't going to be around forever. So you guys have to learn from me and then you have to like keep rolling it forward. Like those of you who have the teaching bug, embrace the teaching bug. And then I just want a little bit of extra creamy ivory and some bleach linen, I think, for my high, 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 high highlights. Those of you who notice I'm using a well palette, um, there's a reason for that. I'm not just stuck in the ancient dark ages of miniature painting. Um, this is actually a special well palette. It's uh, It's got a lot, a lot of wells in it. And it's and they're very much smaller than you the normal, like, flower-shaped ones you see. And uh, this is key because it allows you to uh, expose minimum surface area to the air. So essentially when I mix up these big paint puddles and I always use at least, you know, six drops of fluid between water and paint or whatever um, in each well, but the size of the puddle essentially means that the paint is gonna have a pretty deep well of liquid underneath the surface, which means it stays at the consistency I need it for longer, even though I'm working on a well palette. A lot of people switch off of the well palette because the paint dries right away, and that's mostly because they're, one, not using enough paint, and two, not adding water, or not adding enough water. I tend to work, uh, I tend to start at a two to one ratio, paint to water, which is pretty thin. Unless, I, if I'm doing base coating, uh, then I start, like, straight out of the bottle with Master Series, or uh, usually it's more like a five to one, five to one or six to one. You can, some paints, if they're high coverage with MSP, you can base coat with four to one, but yeah, it depends. Your mileage may vary. 
Oh yeah, totally. I corrupted my um my niece and nephew, Mistress Torturous. So totally. Uh, da -da -da, Polyas and Partha. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you applied yourself to Declarman. Like you've really applied yourself. Okay, so here's our selection of colors with with our fur colors, guys. Just to show you, if I need um a warmer glaze, it's actually really easy to just grab this over here. Thin it down, and you can see how warm that color really is. A lot of that is coming from our two warmer browns in there. The load of yellow. Because even though it doesn't look it, russet brown, i.e. burnt umber in disguise, um, also has a, a mega front load of, of yellow pigment to keep it warm. And that also works with the oxides to essentially bring it into that warm, toasty brown color. I had to mess around a lot until I nailed my, uh, my yellow, my brown, my burnt umber. I, uh, I got a, a tube of artist burnt umber, uh, in the shade that I really liked and I deconstructed it to try to figure out what pigments to mix to make it. Uh, this palette is Cheap Joe's. Um, there are some on Amazon, but I've had heard, heard, uh, people say that those are like, kind of just like have a coating on them. Like they're not the ceramic because this is ceramic. Um, and the ceramic I love because it's so easy to clean. You just throw it in the sink with some hot water, maybe a spritz of cleanser or some dish soap, but let it sit for five minutes, um, soak, and then just take a green scrubby. It comes right up. So I like having my fresh white palette, uh, again, after every uh, paint thing. Let me get my granny glasses on because my, my warranty on my eyes expired at, uh, age 40. And, uh, now I have to actually use magnification only for close up stuff. Yeah, Cheap Joe's Art Supply, just look for ceramic palette. You're going to be fine. They've got the big, this is a 28 well palette, which I also love because I like to, I like to continue to fill it up as I can, you know, as I paint a figure. I think the most I've ever filled up technically is like 21 rows on a project. And that was when I was mixing everything. Like I essentially chose to do an entire project with clear brights. So that's essentially, you know, your clear red, clear yellow, clear green, blue, purple, and, and the oxides and just paint an entire model mixing everything. Um, which taught me how much of a pain in the butt that is. <laughs> yeah, it's really inexpensive, this palette. And they're pretty, I mean, they're pretty durable. I mean, it's ceramic, so don't drop it on a concrete floor. Um, but other than that. All right, so let's get on. I want to get these little paws. Uh, I do, I did go a little orange, orangier on those little paws. I'm going to take my creamy ivory bleached linen mix. I may also mix in a little bit of Harvest Brown at this point, or actually get a little bit in a well so I can pull from it. I do actually use my well palette a lot like a wet palette at times. Um, I tend to just mix up my wells and then do spot mixes on upper surfaces if I need that. And since her feet are so tiny, that's probably what I'm going to do. I'm just going to mix up a little bit of this Harvest Brown, which is, again, that very orange brown. It's going to warm up some stuff because her feet actually are, are pretty warm. They, they are orangey, the, the fur on the dark parts. So I'm going to embrace that. Hello, Jet. But yeah, so it's a cool palette. Um, like I said, in order to get your mileage from it, do, do use deep wells. And if you are in an environment where, see, that's, that orange is that color right up. So now it's very warm. So I tend to use it like this. And if, if I like a mix and if I find I'm going back to it, then I just build a bigger puddle of it. But, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. but yeah, if you find that you're in a very dry climate or like you're, uh, it's winter and you're in a basement with a dehumidifier or with a heater heating unit that's sucking a lot of the moisture out of the air, just make your, your puddles bigger. I always tell people, people are always so afraid of wasting paint, but there's like 350 to 400 drops in a bottle of this. I counted. <laughs> Do you wonder? I did. I did count it. So, um, you're going to be, I mean, I paint every day pretty much. For at least an hour and a half, if not longer, depending on what I'm doing that day as far as my job. And it takes me six months to go through a bottle of Pure White, and I use Pure White all the time. So just to give you an idea, you guys, it, even if you paint a lot, you're probably going to take at least six months to a year to go through one bottle of the one or two colors you use the most often. So putting eight drops on your palette is not a waste of paint. It's, it's like... You know, it's more of a waste of paint if you just keep adding, like, little bits. Yeah, yeah. But even so, who cares if it's discontinued paint in our eye? It's still going to take you. Are you using that color every day? Okay, then maybe you're going to be out in a year. 
So while you still have it, that's the time to figure out how to mix a new color. Although I did talk about, um, if you look at the Bones Weird Browns, uh, handout from two, if you're on my Patreon, I'm sorry. If you're not on my Patreon, then then let me just say that there are a couple of Bones Browns that you can use to mix uh, some of those canceled colors, but it really depends on what. And I even talked yesterday about like Peacock Green. If you want to mix Peacock Green, use Brilliant Green, which is still in print, and just add a little blue to it. Um, so now is the time, while you still have examples of that paint, to kind of figure out, okay, well, how can I make this? Because well, when you've got the wet sample, and that's always what I, I uh, matched from. I never matched from the dried color. I always matched from the wet sample because I, for me, it let me see the shift better when I was mixing colors. Um, Dragonfire. I don't know what that one is. Or Fire Glow. What, is it Propaint Nomad Zeke? Yeah. I mean, all things must pass. If it's a metallic, if it's one of those funky Propaints metallics, then yeah. Those are unlikely to come back. So I'm just going to highlight her little paws a little bit. And I'll probably mix up some, uh, yeah, I may use my, my umber mixture here, my dark brown mixture. I'm going to add a drop of water to it because I see that it's kind of, it's a little thicker. It doesn't have as much fluid in it. So it's going to dry up around the edge a little bit. Once you see that tackiness around the edge, so you know that the, the paint is starting to, you know, starting to think about drying a little bit. That's when you put your, uh, drop of water in just mix it up it does take a little habit uh, habit building to kind of keep an eye on your paint when you use a well palette to kind of make sure that if you're using a color and you're co that you're cognizant of when it starts to kind of get tacky around the edges of the well that's when it's starting to evaporate and just pop a pop a drop of water in it chestnut gold though is very mixable palomino gold Right now, I would mix Palomino Gold with... The, the best thing to mix it with is going to be the brown oxide. The oxide brown when it comes out with Kickstarter. And you, you should be able to, to reverse engineer that um, in Aura. Um, the other, the next best color to use, let me think, maybe Ruddy Leather? Just a touch of Ruddy Leather? Mm, somewhere around there. I don't need... Oh... Oh, metallic red. Yeah, I don't remember it being called Dragonfire, though. That must have been before my time. I remember Red Steel, and I remember Fire Glow. Those are the red and orange ones that I remember. Fire Glow was the orange metallic. And Red Steel was a red. Obviously. Alright, so let's just get a nice color on here. And I'm going to shade in around her paws. We are going to make her claws white so they stand out. Bloodstone's really close to Tianzia Jade. Like, it was just a, a teal, so... It's a more vibrant teal, shifting. I mean, maybe somewhere between Peacock and Tianzia, but... There are many, many um, very vibrant teals in Master Series right now. So I don't feel bad about Bloodstone. When I feel bad is when something uh, just isn't there. Like, there's nothing like it in the line. And over the years, we've tried to... So a little bit of lining between the little paws there. Yeah, it was an intense teal. We have lots of teals, though. Like, I don't... I look at... I think about Bloodstone, and I'm like, Chanzia plus a little bit of clear blue, maybe. Maybe. Or a little bit of... Um, uh, deep ocean. Probably a little bit of deep ocean. Hey, dog father, how's it going? Yeah, I remember it. Like, uh, even though Pro Paint was kind of before my time, it was still in production when I started at Reaper. So I did mix those colors. I just didn't mix them near as much as I mixed MSP. But yeah, I mean, when anything dies like that, it's just not selling. That's why I always say if you love, if you love a paint color... You know, buy it yourself, yes, but talk about it. Get people converted to using it. Tell them why you like it. That's how you. That's how you get the paint colors staying in, uh, in circulation. All right, I'm gonna grab some brown liner and just get a little bit of extra shading down here. We talked a lot of paint, uh, paint chem stuff, for a bit, Dogfather. That's what you missed. 
but don't worry if you've you've been on my streams for so long you've probably heard it all before <laughs> griffin tan yeah those warm tans chestnut gold and griffin tan it's like those are the colors, I think, because I've, I've done so many of them and I brought back so many of them and seen them canceled again. But those are the colors I think people just don't understand how useful they are. Like, a nice warm neutral tan is so freaking useful for so many things. And uh, I just think people don't know the value of it. So, like, you know, chestnut gold, one of one of our MVP colors, but now uh, now canceled. Just because people just didn't know how to use it. And, uh, sadly, I cannot be everywhere teaching everybody how to use every single color. Yeah, actually, I dug Corporeal Shadow out the other day. Um, if you ask Caporia, though, she'll tell you how to mix it in our super easy mix, and both colors that, it, that make it are still in production. Although you might not get exactly the same thing. Th that's the thing, is Caporeal Shadow is actually one of the most difficult paints to mix that I've had to do recently. Um, and the reason is that... When you, when you create a new color by mixing two previous colors, it actually makes it very difficult if those previous colors have different bases. And those previous colors did. In fact, the uh, I think like four different bases went into Corporeal Shadow. Don't quote me on that, but it was a complicated color. It's at least three. At least three. And that's before you even start figuring and parsing out the pigments. Um, and trying to figure it out in the right ratio. So the actual corporeal shadow paint, I actually have it right here, special edition. Um, maybe a little bit different from what you can mix with the two colors that, that Corporea actually uses to mix it. But, uh, that's just because I had to adjust when I was trying to make it. It's like, well... Because when you're making a color by mixing two other colors, too, there's a little bit of variance every time you mix it. Both because, you know, the paint parameters will shift to just a tiny bit. Or maybe you got a slightly larger drop of X or Y. There we are. Just getting some lining in here. I want to, I got a little bit muddy around these little paws. And of course, when you're working 28 millimeter, you want everything to stand out. So you punch your, punch your shadows and your highlights and uh, punching your shadows. The easiest, simplest way to get an extra bit of shadow pop in there is to line. A lot of people don't like lining because it does look cartoony on larger models. Often they don't line. Um, sometimes I don't line on larger models. Although most often I find I do. I just do it very subtly. Gonna add a little bit more water into my little highlight paw highlight color. Let's just call it that paw highlight color. And then we're gonna mix a slightly bigger puddle of it because I foresee it being useful. So I'm mixing kind of a warm, warm light brown with all of my previous colors. So we're creating a nice range of uh, brown hues to work with. Uh, Griffin Tan is quite close to Chestnut Gold and, um, well, the tan color is in Old HD. Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry about the, uh, the terrible commercials. So, yeah, now we've got kind of a, a mixture of, there's my brown liner, there's the Harvest Brown, which is very orange, and now this is this new brown that I mixed to highlight some of the dark fur. Um, I wanted it warm. I may want it even a little more warm than that if I want it. To go that way, I just add a little bit of my harvest and slide it that way. Browns are very easy to mix. Like you just once you once you realize it's like it's either going toward yellow, toward orange, toward red, or toward black, or technically toward white, you know. But it, it's going to go one of those ways. Oh, thank you, Flickster. Thank you for the continuation of the subness. Awesome, thank you. We appreciate it. Like. Uh, Justin sometimes talks about this and he's not with us right now, but hopefully he'll get home soon. But, uh, Justin often talks about the fact that, you know, it took a while for Reaper to embrace the thought of doing this channel and, uh, the thing that keeps them interested in it and investing in it is, is of course, you know, the subs. Um, so essentially if we make enough to, uh, pay for me and Justin and other people, um, 
then we get to continue doing this awesome thing for a living. And uh, so we do really appreciate every sub we get. It really does matter, guys. Like, your sub does matter. Like, people stop in there. They're like, oh, I want to support the little guy. I don't want to support a big company. But Reaper's main business is not streaming. And so if we can't show Ed and Dave that it's worth it, that we're reaching an audience, that we're able to sustain ourselves, then, you know, Reaper might pair back on what it's doing. So we really do appreciate the subs. Uh, the, the streaming department at Reaper is very much run kind of as a little separate entity because Dave wanted to see if it was really feasible business-wise. Remember that Reaper is run by accountants, and it's half of why Reaper is still in business after all these years, is that they are always, it sounds heartless and cruel, but they are always looking at the bottom line. Um, and that enables us to keep uh, keep functioning at a high level in this in this business. So yeah, we totally always really appreciate your subs. Um, it's hard to say. There's really not a good way to measure that in RS. Sometimes it does. Like, um, with Josh's show, Miniature Monday, he does paint kits. Like, he essentially puts together these are the paints I'm going to use this week and, uh, offers them as a kit. And so it does, his show pushes sales in that capacity. But how much is that, actually? I have no idea. Um, I know that sometimes when I use an unusual color, sometimes there'll be a slight run on it, depending on how many people watch the video. Uh, you know, we usually have between between 70 and 120 people watching this stream. Uh, and then a lot more maybe go catch the VOD. So, but it's very hard to quantify. Other than a sale that's obviously coming, like if I use an unusual color, then we'll notice that that color uh, has a jump, right? But if, you, but if you're just using the regular colors here uh, that usually sell, how can you tell, right? How can you tell that that this stream influenced somebody to run out and buy some russet brown. You really can't. Um, there's not a lot of tools available to assess that. Yeah, you can. I mean, that's, that's one thing. Um, I'm sure there are... I don't know. Justin would know more about tools, but... Nomad Zeke, it's, with a stream like mine, it's really, uh, like, sometimes they'll see a run on a model, you know, from a stream. Like, maybe the Sphinx sold a little, sells a little more when I work on her, for example, you know. Um, I don't know if the cat folk has sold more since I started streaming with her. We'd have to look at the numbers. I mean, Reaper has the ability to pull the data and see if the cat folk has spiked a little um, from when I started painting her as opposed to before that, right? But, but then it's like, well, how much is it significant? Is it a 10% increase or more? No idea. Good deal. Well, the thing is that Reaper Reaper has always thought that felt that the best advertising is simply to put out a superior product. Reaper doesn't actively advertise. So yes, our Twitch our Twitch thing does get us an audience and engage it's more an audience engagement tool though, I think. That's what Reaper looks at this. They don't look at the Twitch streaming necessarily as advertising. I think they look at it more as audience engagement. But it, I could be wrong about that. This, this stream makes the Reaper wish whistle really, really long. Well, good. Good, good. All right. So I've defined the, the fingers a little bit more. So I'm happy with that. I do want to bring out a little bit more of the fur texture here on the arms like I did on the legs. So I'm going to grab my uh, thing. If I had to guess, guys, I would say that, you know, the streams probably do impact sales, maybe 5%. I would be shocked. Like, in the case of miniatures or an unusual paint, maybe by 10% of that item's annual sales, maybe. But I would be surprised if it was more than that. Because we we do so much business with um, with more of the gaming submarket and the D&D &D submarket, right? So... You can never underestimate, like, the power of Reaper's, like, main base. And I, and it's hard to judge what our main base is, too, now these days. Because I know that painters are a higher percentage of it. People who, who game, but who also love to paint, right? So, like, a lot of you guys. Um, and that's definitely been a shift since I started at the company. Because, like, okay, so when I started at Reaper, 
the models that you would see in the top 100 or the top 10 or the top whatever would be like goblins, kobolds, you know, things like that. Is That's what you'd see. Maybe you'd see, like, a, if there's a particularly um, strong character class, you might see a really good sculpt of that be in the top. But then as after I came in and as we as we really shifted our attention toward appealing to the painter market more, um, to the people who not only gamed but who also just liked to paint and liked the artistic side of it, um, then we saw models like female paladins be in the top, female elven archer, you know, things that we knew it wasn't everybody playing a female paladin. It was just the model was good and people wanted to paint it. So we started seeing that shift. And now I would guess that it's it's kind of, it's still weighted on the gaming side, I guess. I, again, I haven't looked at anything. I know nothing. But if I had to guess based on, you know, what we see, I think that... Uh, Probably the gaming side is still a very heavy weight and a very large part of Reaper, especially since Bones. Yeah, exactly, Kihasu. Back in, and I started at Reaper, just to give you an idea, in uh, two months from now, two, a little more than two months from now, will be my 18 year anniversary with working at Re working with Reaper, being a Reaper employee. Now I'm a remote Reaper employee, but for 17 years, I worked on site at the company full time. Um, so we still see a lot of the gaming community's impact right it has a very heavy impact especially with dnd 5e being so popular with dnd booming now and finding a new audience with kids um you you're gonna see the gaming pendulum swing again right because uh that's a big audience so it's very interesting to me it's always been very interesting to me to look at sales and and, you know, and Ed is fond of saying that, you know, he, he has given up trying to um, predict the market and to predict what models are going to sell better than others. Because so many of his guesses have been wrong that he's just been like, ah. Oh. <laughs> right, exactly, Mistress, right. And, and when you start, and I, I talk to a lot of people at conventions and in my classes and everything like that, you know, and on the stream who are like, yeah, I started out just loving miniatures because of gaming, but then I really just started liking to paint miniatures, right? And so you see that shift where you're going to grab it if it's cool. You don't care anymore, right? I, I don't play Warhammer anymore, but if a Games Workshop model comes out that's really cool, I'll buy it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something I do as well, Kariniko, like, um, usually. Although I, I vary it up these days. But I do tend to like metal. As long as the, I, I, if I can get the model in metal, if I'm going to paint it for my character, then yes, I, I do prefer to get it in metal. But that's, that could be just me being old school. But yeah, it's a very interesting thing to have watched the hobby evolve over the years. Because you definitely had, like, in the 90s, miniatures sold for gaming, and they didn't sell as well if they were a one-off monster that was unique, or if they, you know, weren't a popular class or race. And we still see that. Like, the less popular races, they're, the miniatures just don't sell as well. Um, but you still have to offer them, right? Like, if you're, if you're gonna appeal to the crowd, you still have to give the gnome player, you know, a character option. You might not get as many options is the problem, right? So Reaper can't make everything. Let me get a little pause here. Over here, I want the underside of her paws to be lighter, but I've got to get some uh, some colors on there. Yeah, those of us who like like the less popular races are uh, like half orcs. Like I had to pretty much convert my half orc, orc monk for the game that I'm running on my stream. Like, I just had to find a good... And finding even a good female human monk model, good luck, right? Like, it can be very hard. But finding a, a good female half-orc monk, yeah, not going to happen. So I ended up just finding a good female monk and then converting, giving her, like you know, pointed ears and putting a fangs on her. Or tusks, I guess. Yeah, I mean, vote with your dollars, for sure. I think what, what sometimes, uh, I mean, people underestimate, though, with the sales thing and all that is, is you know, you're like, yeah, but I do this. Yeah, but as long as, if, if, if you do it, it's great. If you and your 10 best friends do it, now we're talking. Um, so that's why I say for those of you who instruct, who teach, who reach a wider audience, 
or who just have big gaming groups that you're involved in. Talking about the models and paints that you really enjoy and why gets people curious enough to buy them. I mean, let's face it, we're gamers. We like to spend money on our hobby. Painters are the same, whether you game or not, actually, um, obviously. So, you know, it doesn't take much to get somebody to try something out. If you really like it, talk about it. All right, I'm just going to highlight the tips of the fingers a little bit more just to get the eye on them. And that's something that I wouldn't necessarily do if this was a bigger model, right? So when you've got a bigger model, you're thinking more about realistic light and you can do that on these little guys too, if you want to. Um, but it also can be hard sometimes to try to emphasize all the appropriate um, areas because everything is so small on these little guys, so. Oh yeah, Guernica. Yeah, dragons always sell. Like, now. Okay, dragons sell now um, better than they did because Bones. Because Bones makes dragons affordable. Uh, they still don't sell as often. Like, some dragons are very popular and others are not as popular. And some are popular but just don't sell as much because they've got a big price tag. There's, I mean, the, the basic laws of economics do still come into play. If people have a chunk of money and they have the choice of getting 20 other cool miniatures or one dragon, you know, that, that they're going to, there are a lot of people that are going to choose the 20 cool miniatures. So money, cost does come into play still. The Kickstarter helps uh, pay for those big models though. So that's why Reaper keeps using the, big, the Kickstarter model, even though we're uh, getting to be a, a medium sized company now. We used to be a small company. Like, when I started at Reaper, less than 25 people worked for it. Alrighty, let's try to do some tail stripes. But yeah, I always was fascinated when I worked for Reaper. I would often ask um, Reaper Brian or, or Ed or, you know, whoever um, to pull numbers for me for sales numbers. I was always fascinated to see what... Um, what sold, what didn't sell, right, in the paint lines. So I'm going to start doing rings on the tail. Uh, I've got a little, there's a little bit of kind of almost a diamond-shaped growth pattern here in the fur as Julie has sculpted it. Um, so I'm going to kind of embrace that. You want to block in and ignore, ignore the fur, like, first. You want to just paint over it as if it's cloth. You just want to get your rings started. You want your rings to, to get started on. Um, so you've got to block in that lighter color. And I'm using... I think I'm using kind of a mixture. I grabbed a mix. I grabbed a mix of this, which is actually the lighter color on the side of her face here. So it's what we're going to work up to. But I wanted also something that would blend with this warmer brown. So I added in a little bit of our, our hybrid here. Um, yeah. There are minis in the Kickstarter that you haven't seen on the website. Oh, um, today's Kickstarter, like, you mean Bones 5 Kickstarter, Kihasu? Because Bones 5 hasn't shipped yet. So, but Bones 4, I think, is... There was, like... I'm not sure about Bones 4. Like, do we have Dance of Death yet? There are also things that... Um, if it's not on the website, though, that usually means that it's not even released yet. So it depends on which Kickstarter you're talking Bones 5? Bones 5 has not released at all. Um, but after it ships and fulfills, then it will release. So it usually takes quite a while. Like, uh, there's a reason that kicks, that Reaper tends to go a full year or more between Kickstarter campaigns. And I don't know if we're going to have another Kickstarter campaign or not. Depends on Ed and Ron. Um, but uh, you do the Kickstarter campaign. Then it takes, like, a year or more to actually get your product so that you can fulfill your Kickstarter because there's so much of it, in Reaper's case. And then you can put it on the website and sell it. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, then you just have to wait until we fulfill. So fulfillment was still scheduled. I forget what Ed's last um, update was on uh, Reaper Live. Do you guys know off the top of your heads, those of you who go and watch Reaper Live? I think he was still aiming for spring, but COVID was... Um, the, shipping, uh, the shipping snafu is really slowing us down now. So be if you haven't read about it, essentially... Uh, the ports don't have enough labor to move the product fast enough. 
So there are huge container, yeah, huge container ships currently just sitting, like, like huge clusters of them, sitting, waiting at, like, the Port of Los Angeles and places like that, because they just don't have the labor to unload them. So they keep making temporary slip bays for the, or, or temporary anchorages zones for them to be in, because they just can't unload them fast enough. So, phone six confirmed? Okay. So, then if it fulfills in April or May, um, usually it takes us a couple months to totally fulfill Kihasu. Because it, it's a, like, the whole company shuts down everybody. And we even, like, take in temp labor to ship out our Kickstarter. Um, so if it takes a couple months, figure June, July, they'll start releasing it in summer. They'll start releasing Bones 5 in summer. So then you'll see it on the website. Yeah, it's totally the shipping thing, VCR. Totally the shipping thing. So, all right, I'm going to grab more of this color. So I'm just painting right over. I'm not, uh, let me get close so you can see. Just painting stripes, guys, and I'm not paying attention to uh, really leaving shadows. And I'm not trying to paint every individual hair, but I am trying to paint in the direction of the hair so that if I do leave a brush stroke that's evident, it will blend in to the hair, the fur. And this is where I'm kind of using my well palette as a wet palette. I'm grabbing a little bit of that, and I'm grabbing a little bit of this and pulling it up the side and mixing it on the edge here. So I, I do, and some people may ask, well, why aren't you just using a, a, a wet palette then, Anne? And the reason is that I hate how the wet palette messes with my paint consistency. I don't like that the wet palette leaches more water into my mixture. I get my mixture exactly where I want it. I want it to stay that way. And that's pretty much impossible on a wet palette. Wet palette, you're, you're, um, you know, you're more versatile probably, but uh, you've got to kind of adjust your paint as you go. And people who are really good with wet palettes just do that habitually, and to them it's not a, not a fuss. But for me, I don't like it. So I like to dial in my colors and dial in my paint consistency and then just go for it. So this is why I always tell people, try both types of palettes. Keep in mind that each one has strengths and weaknesses. See which one works for you and your painting style. So we're getting those rings on there. <laughs> I don't think your dragon will starve. Yeah, nothing's moving, Kasu. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, everything is just, like, backed up. Like, I kind of feel like maybe dock workers should be on the next essential personnel to get vaccinated list. <laughs> like, because uh, they want the economy to get better. It would be nice if goods could actually move, right? All right, so here we go. So I think that's the last ring. I'm going to leave her with a dark tail tip. Some of the dragons can hibernate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I read I read it. That was just I just summarized it for the show watchers who didn't get it. I actually am part of the Bones 5 Kickstarter. Actually I bought in every year since we started because I uh even though I was an employee and I could, you know, technically get a discount on the stuff after it released, I felt like I wanted to support the company. So I do have I did order um stuff from bones five like the, the kid adventurers like christine uh van Patten's sculpts had to get those they're so adorable and the mandapar pass encounter with the huge like you know temple face i just i love terrain I, I couldn't resist it's not like i need a giant like you know tibetan temple face mountain but um well i guess i do because i, I ordered one anyway <sighs> if you ordered enough halflings at dwarves along with your dragon he should be fine that's like like putting like the guppies in your cichlid tank. You know, eventually they'll all get eaten. You can just leave your cichlid over the you know over the uh, week while you're gone on vacation. Yeah, the kid adventurers are great. Christine is Christine has gotten to be Christine is a testament to if you are passionate about something and you just go for it, how good you can get in relatively little time. Because she she learned to sculpt. I want to say in like six months. Like, and she's doing pro level now. Like, it's insane how good Christine got so fast. And it's because she's passionate about it and she really committed herself to it. And she didn't let, like, fear, like, stop her, right? Well, if they sell really well, VCR, then we will. If they don't sell, like, if something goes wildfire, if something starts to sell like blazes, people notice. Like, Reaper notices that there are things they cannot keep in stock. 
And that's an argument for more things like that. I mean, it's how, that's how the mouselings happened, right? Like, Jean did the mouselings, and uh, Reaper was like, okay, mouselings, these are cute. And then the mouselings went bazonkers and sold 60 zillion copies. And suddenly there were more mouselings, right? So Reaper will notice. Yeah, Christine's nice, AKT, AKT, I agree. Ah, yeah, yeah. They don't limit no, they limit them they limit themselves to nothing. Those fish are very aggressive. I had saltwater fish, so I couldn't uh, do the same thing really. Although actually I did um I had sailfin mollies, which also reproduce pretty uh high and can go brackish, so they can live for a while in saltwater. So that was when I was breeding food for my lionfish that I used to have back when I had a saltwater tank. And I stopped doing saltwater because I'd rather have the fish stay on the reef in general. But uh, but lionfish are actually kind of a verminous species. Like they breed, they proliferate proliferate rapidly, and they eat other fish um, like way out of control. So I didn't feel bad about having a lionfish. I'm fine with taking a lionfish off the reef. But in general, now of course, and now you have to wonder with reefs dying if we can turn it around fast enough. Or if uh, the saltwater fish hobby is going to be like trying to propagate, help propagate uh, species. It's so difficult though because the pelagic state of those fish is so tiny. Oh, do we have a Justin? Or is that a different person? I just heard. Yeah, we got there. Yay, you're back! Yay! Awesome. We've been talking about all sorts of stuff. You know, like we do. I'm glad that you're back. We're doing stripes on this tail. So now, guys, now that I'm bringing in this uh, creamy ivory and bleached linen mixture here, now I'm paying attention to where the fur is. Now, in a larger model, um, I don't have Mr. Grumpy close to hand, but if I was doing a bigger model with a lot of fur, like a big ruff or something, and it was a, a, a very much larger piece, I would do a couple layers of highlight without even doing the little fur. Like I would not, um, usually fur or hair texture, I'm going to hit the last thing I do is where I'm going to start picking out individual hairs. Up to that point, I'm just going to be trying to say just volume and highlighting and color. Um, I quit with all the I know we could have talked politics and gotten everybody up in arms at each other. No, let's not go there. <laughs> I like my friendly streams. Thank you. Oh, and I need to put a, I wanted to put a stripe on the back of her head. Let's do that. But yeah, we did. We, we avoided politics and religion, but we did talk um, business models and stuff. I was, I was uh, quick to say that I did not know what sales figures were on anything, but I, uh, we did talk a little bit about why things. And about how hard it is to uh, to tell if the stream actually sells stuff, except in the case of Josh's stream, where it's designed that way. Okay, so we'll put a little chevron stripe on the back of her head. I kind of like that. That's really nice. I can accentuate it up top, too. Oh, yeah, it's really hard to breed saltwater fish. Like, you just have to have the, a very gentle filtration system for when they're super microscopic and... Uh, and, you know, you've got to really give them an environment that they like. It's very difficult. I never went into the breeding. I just read a lot about um, oceanography and that sort of thing and conservation. I really loved it when uh, before the when I was out here last winter before the pandemic, uh, David and I went down to Monterey and we got to go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and I love aquariums for that reason. I like to read about the oceanography and the propagation and the, you know, species that are endangered and why and. All that sort of thing. I like fishies. That's the bottom line. I like fishies. I like to eat them and I like to look at them. And I like sharks, but I have no urge to go in a shark cage ever. So now we've got our, our stripes coming in. You guys wanted a stripey tail, so I hope you're happy. So now I do have to put some more tight detail up here, though, because the stripey tail is the first thing you look at. Remember, I warned you guys about that. The minute you do like a pattern on fur, it, it's freehand. It's what you're doing. And freehand always attracts the eye because it's a cluster of tight detail. And so our eyes go, ooh, a cluster of tight detail. What's that? It's the human eyeball and what it likes to look at. So um, when you do this, you have to keep in mind 
that you need to balance everything as far as what is uh, drawing the attention of the viewer. Unless you just want everybody to stare at your cat, cat rogue's butt. I mean, that's, you know, something, it's your prerogative, but. Yeah, sharks are beautiful, but um, I've had, like, nightmares about the deep water since I saw Jaws as a tiny child. Thanks, Dad. So. Like, a five-year-old should not be watching Jaws, okay? Just for the record. Not unless you want her to have a, a, a lifelong... Fascination of, with and fear of deep water. Like, no way am I scuba diving. No way. Not even though it would be really cool to see a blue whale or a manta ray or something. Like, that would be cool, but also terrifying. This is true. This is like cat butt syndrome, where cats do want you to look at their butts. So if you want to take it that way, then awesome. But I personally prefer a, uh, a more balanced uh, figure. So I'm going to have to do something clever up here, some sharp edging, some bright, shiny highlights on the screen armor, something to distract the eye so that it, I want it to go everywhere. I want it to move around the figure. You like the big pointy fishies? Yeah, I haven't been to the Atlanta Aquarium, but but Monterey Bay was beautiful. Like there, that big central tank they've got is just gorgeous. I loved it. Luckily, David and I like to go the same places. It's like very refreshing to have somebody who wants to go to aquariums and art museums with me. <laughs> it's a weird combo. We are, we are, our hobbies in common are, are kind of funny. All right. So we got just a little bit of fur there. So you see how bringing out the little tiny bits of fur there. And when you make these little dots, like if you just pick out like the tail, the bit and the tail end haha, of the of the fur uh, clusters, what you get is a fluffier look. So if you do more of a long stroke, guys, then it's going to look like the fur is closer to the head. And if you do more of a more dots, it'll look bushier. Pevnik, thank you. The the half a half an uh, subversary, six month subversary. So it's it's the half a year a half a year anniversary. Yeah, jellyfish are cool. <laughs> Karenico, I turned out fine. Honest, I just I have a I have this lasting fear of big things in deep water, like. And that's, I mean, that's fine. It hasn't driven, it hasn't like, uh, you know, impacted my quality of life or anything. It just means that I'm not going to uh, go scuba diving or sh shark tanking. I mean, it, I, it does act that way, though. That is fair to say that different people react in different ways, right? For me, I love, like, I love documentaries about sharks and other big fish in the water. And I'm just in awe of them. And I love whales. But the thought of going out in, like, in the water with them scares me bazonkers. Like, oh my god, no way. No way. I don't care how much I love the whales. I don't want to be in the water with them. Well, part of me does, but the, the other part of me is like, no way. Nope, 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 nope. There, there are things out there that can eat me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like crazy. Yeah, basking sharks are really big. I remember reading about them when I was a kid. I, liked, I really like sharks as far as I think they're really neat animals. I just don't want to be with them really close. Really up close and personal. Alright, so I'm just going to pick out a little bit of fur texture here on the dark tail. Just a little bit on the upper side. Yeah, I've I've gone whale watching. And that was actually the sad last time I was in Hawaii. I didn't uh, book it far enough in advance so I couldn't go whale watching again. Um, which made me sad because, oh my gosh, whale watching is so cool. <laughs> Whales are so cool! Mostly they're not going to land on your boat. <laughs> Every once in a while, a, a, a whale watching boat has a close call. But I think the whales are just messing with us, guys. And let's face it, considering how we have messed with them over the years, they are A-OK -okay getting some of theirs back. 
Like, it's amazing that they don't just try to crush us all. Like, their, their great granny whales were probably telling horror stories. And then, you know, about what humans used to do. <laughs> but yeah, considering how we've abused the wildlife on our planet, like, I don't blame them. I don't blame them for wanting to eat us or smash us or generally like shake their finger their animal finger at us we've we've been bad to them for a long time yay okay so i darkened down the base of some of those stripes there here we go stripey tail <laughs> flop <laughs> they are really really cool when I was whale watching in Hawaii, we had a humpback whale mama with her baby that was close to our boat. I just remember how massive they are. Like, it's just like, it's like the first time, okay, it's like being like a kid who didn't grow up around big farm animals and like standing next to your first horse and realizing how big that thing is and how much it could hurt you if it wanted to, right? It's just like being, being conscious of the size. And then you take something like a whale and you just multiply it to the nth. It's like, it's like, like the first time you see a really big mountain and you just like the size of it just like hits you. I love that feeling, but man, there are some animals that I will stay far away from. Yes. The ones with teeth, big teeth and bad Hollywood reputations. <laughs> oh yeah. Karinika, I bet. It's like, Hey, are you edible? Are you, what are you boat? Well, and they're smart, right? Like, I have this thing, like, so many animals on our planet are much smarter than we give them credit for. Like, elephants. Elephants and whales. You know there's big brains going on in there. It's like, it's like, it's kind of what I like about dogs. It's like, you can communicate. We can communicate with these creatures. We can learn to, right? But, but, like, they don't speak our language. And it's like having our own little aliens... Like, right there. Like, a, something that does not think like we do, does not sense the world like we do, and does not speak like we do, right? But ha but is intelligent and can communicate. So, I always am kind of in awe when I think about that stuff. Like, a lot of people just have their dog and they've got their dog, but your dog is like your own little alien. Like, it's it's an alien intelligence that you are communicating with. And if you remember that and you try to like remember that it's not a human and you have to teach it, you know, what you mean, then you get along with your dog a lot better in general. All right, so just lightening up this and bringing out this fur texture a bit more. Oh yeah, I remember her. Yeah, 20 plus feet great white shark. I know, right? Like, think about that for a minute. Think about how big that is. That's a school bus, isn't it? Like, they are great and fascinating creatures. But please, please do not put me in the water with that. <laughs> big shark. Could open up mouth and go nom. Nom. All right, I'm just going to do a little bit of fur, a little bit of highlight here as it comes down toward the darker paws. And we got to get the leg on this side. We got to make sure we've got a nice dark shadow behind the tail where it intersects with the legs so we get that shape. Right, exactly, Kihasu. It's, it's a different territory. But just the size thing, right? And then it translates. And then and then the fact that, yeah, the water is their element, not ours. So you were relatively helpless there. Although, if a horse is really out to get you, you're pretty helpless too, unless you climb a tree. <laughs> I learned to sit on a horse and I learned to, to ride, like, not terribly. 
Like I could I could stay on a horse. A horse tried to buck me off and I was able to stay on it. But um yeah, I was not really ever comfortable with animals. Then part of it is the size with those animals rather. Like many teenage girls, I really liked horses, but I came to the conclusion that dogs were more my speed. See, it's just like some whales. I guess the thing with whales is that like they're not out to eat you, unlike sharks. Generally, I assume. I mean, I guess killer whales could be out to eat you. But I don't think I hear many stories of orcas attacking people. Maybe I'm just in the wrong part of the country. Then again, shark attacks aren't uh, terribly common either. Like, relatively speaking. I was trying to darken down this area, so I did a little bit of a glaze. A little bit of extra shading on the thigh here. Yeah, horses were more dangerous than sharks in Australia. Yeah, I can see that. Well, I mean, because humans interact with them more often. You're probably more likely to get uh, kicked or uh, thrown from a horse and break something serious than uh, you are to get bitten by a shark. Plus, I mean, at least out on, like, Cape Cod, which is where my ex's uh, family uh, lived, um, they always would have people watching. If, if there were shark sightings, then they would, like, close the beaches and stuff like that. So, Or at least have warnings. And, you know, everybody was very conscious of it. And so I think that minimizes um, incidents. Still have a little bit of green that got up into her fur there. I need to fix that. There. Yes, cows are more dangerous than sharks, I believe it. Yeah, that's what I thought up in Adams. I, I had never, ever heard of it. I'm going to come in and just get a little bit of this lighter fur back here. But a lot of this leg is in shadow, so we won't get much. Just got to get a little bit. Bring out some of the fur texture. There we go. And the tail's over that hock joint, so we don't need to highlight that. <laughs> yeah, if you get down to like Hawaii um, or anywhere else where there is whale watching, I do highly recommend it, especially if you have kids. Take your kids. Um, it's an experience that really lends itself to like them being more conscious about such things like the environment, how fragile it is, you know, like that there are like getting instilling a sense of like wonder and awe. These things are so just gigantic and so smart. And it's not just a show at SeaWorld, right? It's very different as a kid who was brought to SeaWorld and then a kid who later went whale watching. I'll choose the whale watching anytime. Like, the whale watching gave me such more of a sense of the creatures, of the animals, than any silly show. I'm so glad that a lot of the water parks are being forced to stop the shows. Yeah, and I really am not behind whale hunting either. Yeah, you're right. There, Kariko, there are still people who do it. Time for your sub to get a learner's permit, Valentar. <laughs> ah. Yeah, thanks, Gallifier. It's uh We've been working on fur today, giving our giving our um 
our Siamese point tabby, or our, our uh, tabby point Siamese is a, a stripe, bit of stripe piece. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's rather, I'd rather be in, uh, go to an aquarium or go out and do whale washing, like, than do, like, SeaWorld. I, I had fun at SeaWorld. I liked because they had a place where you could pet little rays and, and uh, give them little food. It was cute. And I liked rays ever since then. But but that was the one thing at SeaWorld that the ray pool, and I, they don't even have those anymore, I believe, because, you know, they don't want people interacting with the wildlife. Because bad things can happen. But, uh... Yeah, petting the rays and the dolphins, yeah. And that lets you interact as a kid. Like, then you can actually get close to the animal, right? It's not like you're sitting up in the bleachers. What do we got? Oh, another 10 minutes. We started late, so we're going to go a little longer. And I'm going to try to make sure I've got, let's see, the rear paws look good. The rear fur is now looking a lot better. Um, I think I'll add a little bit more... A little bit of color down here. Stripe. Just suggest one little stripe down there. Since she's got stripes, she will suggest she has stripes going all down her back. Yeah, I never, I was always kind of scared of kayaks. Water is like, I love water. I love it. I love it. But at the same time, I'm scared of it. So it's like, uh, like kayaks, I was always afraid I'd roll it and I wouldn't be able to get back up. Like, I know that's an irrational fear, but as a younger person, it kept me from even being interested. The little, the things, the weird things you're scared of as a kid. Oh yeah, my brother rolled his um rolled his Jeep from because of a deer. I do have a healthy respect for water in Ara. It's beautiful and I love it and I love being around it and I'm really happy that we're only like 40 minutes from the ocean where we are. Like that's I've never lived anywhere that's that close to the ocean and I'm super excited especially when stuff opens up again. But but yeah, I have a healthy respect for it. Drowning is like the worst death I can think of. I don't want to go there. Yeah, right. Everybody's got an irrational fear of something, right? Well, most people. Just a something that you're just like, heck no, nope, nope, nope. And sometimes it's not even an irrational fear, right? You just have a healthy respect for it, and you're just like, nope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, deer are, are serious consequences when you're driving, for sure. I'm going to go and line around this paw. And then I'll go and highlight that bit band of fur that I put in up there. And I think other than getting a little bit of extra highlighting on her toes, I think her fur is in pretty good shape. Maybe the shoulder. I need to hit the shoulder a little bit more. So we have at least accomplished fur today. Make sure I've got all my lining in place, all my shadows where I want them. And then I want, I want a little bit more on the toes. And I'm going to actually put one ring on the tail right on the underside of the blade. Because we forgot there is a ring on the tail here on the other side oh yeah boar boars are nasty boars are not yeah I'm with you there boars are not fun talk about a not fun animal wicked vicious I never grew up. I I wasn't didn't have really wild boars anywhere where I've lived. A little bit of a stripey. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Now we're on to the animals we don't like. I'm with you on roaches. They're creepy. Spiders I have, like, this uneasy relationship with because I understand that they are benevolent most of the time, but at the same time, I lived in Texas for 17 years, and uh, we have all the great spiders down there, like the brown recluses and the black widows. So, you know, I had to take my, you know, spiders are nice into spiders can be dangerous and I have to be careful around them kind of mentality. As long as they're not crawling on me, I'm okay. I'm okay with bugs in general as long as it's not on me. And I love butterflies and moths. Some beetles are cool too. We give our little toes a little bit of a highlight, make it come out. There's all sorts of gross bugs, but they think we're gross too. Either that or tasty. Just adding a little bit more extra highlight here. Like on her little toe tips, just to bring stuff out. We live in an apartment, but it's well upkept. Up kept. I, we haven't had any bug problems here. I had more bug problems living in a house than I, I've had in this apartment. All right, so I'm going to use my kind of um, this color to get her claws. I'm going to mix it a little bit with my medium brown to give it kind of a stained ivory. Make that color. Wipe off my brush a bit. Got too much, too much paint on it. I'm just going to get the little tip. Leave the dark at the roots so that you have some definition. You don't want to go pure white when you do claws. You want to start with an, a very a dark off white, a cream, dark cream usually, or dark bone color if you're doing white claws. So that you still have room to put some highlights on them. Claws. Just digging in her claws. <laughs> She's bigger. Oh, yeah. Okay with spiders in the house until you were bitten, and now it's open season, Julie. Yeah. Or Bob, whoever's talking. Yeah, that's not fun. All right, I think we're okay on the fur here. I think we've got, and we got little claws. Um, I guess that shoulder, this shoulder still needs a little bit of fuzzy definition. See, it's a little mucky. So let's get some, uh, let's get some fur on that. Since Julie has sculpted such nice little clumps of fur up here, we will uh, outline them and then we'll take our lighter paint and we will bring out the fur. Which, uh, which animals are we talking about there? Is that what you're talking about, Chibi? Oh, boars. Yeah. Yeah, wild pigs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are nasty. And aggressive. I'm going to put little bits of fur texture now on these highlights. And I'm going a little bit light with this, even though I want the fur on the shoulder here to be a little darker, but I can always go and glaze it or do a wash to knock it down a little bit and the texture will still show through. So kind of what I'm doing here now is almost underpainting because I know that I can come back and darken it or make it a little bit more brown. So that's really light right now, but I'm going to grab our brown and put it over the top in a kind of a wash thing. 
going to actually make it glaze. So glazes are thinner than washes and we don't let them pool. We just put them over if we want to darken or lighten or shift the color of an area and we don't want to run over the texture that we've put down. So I want to tint this warmer and darker. So I'll put that glaze over the top and then I'll rinse out my brush and squeeze it out and come back and make sure that I dab off anywhere that it is pooling just with a little edge of my brush. It will still darken down that area, but I still keep my texture. Oh yeah, we had rattlesnakes in Wisconsin, my grandparents' farm. Oh, scorpions, yep. Yeah, there weren't scorpions. I think there was only just one small kind of scorpion that's up here, up in Denton area. I know Matt Clark had one in a jar once or a cup. Matt was always the guy who who uh, handled our wild beasties when they got in at Reaper. Like the copperhead I found in the ladies' bathroom. That was my fun wildlife encounter at Reaper. Yeah, copperheads like to come in when it's nice and hot outside. They're like, oh, this human house is so nice and cool. I will hide here in this dark closet behind this door. <laughs> the human opens the door and freaks. Can't blame them. We don't like to be outside in Texas in the summer during, you know, either, but we'd rather they did not come and visit us. Yeah, Karniko, we could talk to you about, like, snakes and scorpions. I will say that there's not a whole lot here in the Northwest that's, like, hugely venomous that I know of. So it's more like Wisconsin. This is more like I grew up, more like when I, where I grew up, except it doesn't get cold like Wisconsin does, because it doesn't get that mid-plains kind of effect or... Arctic stuff coming down from Canada. <laughs> GB, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, your grandmother would have a fit. Yeah. I would have had a fit. It's totally. I don't. I mean, I may not like some animals. They may not be like nice and, uh, you know, and happy animals that love humans. And, but uh, you shouldn't be cruel to them either. Like, I really, really hate that. I would get in fights with bullies and kids on the, the playground when they would find an animal and try to do something dumb or stupid or harmful to it. Like, I was that kid. But I was also the kid who they would try to scare because they would find, like, a grass snake and pick it up and scare the girls with it. And they would bring it to me and I would pet it. <laughs> yeah. All right, we are pretty good, guys. Um, it's about quarter after, so we can call it here. Uh, we are making really good progress on Ms. Shadow Eyes. Her fur is done. Her armor is to a soft finish, so we'll probably still put a little bit of extra tweaking on her armor. Um, we need to do our NMMs and finish out our leather and do her eyes. Right, exactly, Chibi. So yeah, so I think I'm pretty happy with how our uh, our lovely um, kitty is coming along. We'll have to figure out if we're going to put her on a, on a base. I'll have to figure out if she fits on a round base. She's got this wide stance, so she might not really fit well on a base. We may just paint the rim uh, and leave this one baseless. So all right, uh, today we did a lot of fur. We added stripes. We did stripes on the head. Oh, I need to add a couple of details there. Um, we tuned up the paws, we did some lining, we did her front claws. The claws on her hands are kind of like not evident. I think she's digging in her feet claws because she's trying to get traction. But her hand claws, she needs them not to be out because she's actually wielding her blades. Since kitties have retractable claws, this can be a thing. There we go. So there we are. So yeah, next time on her, we'll probably work on her eyes, on her leather, and on getting some basic NMM ma mapped out, I think. We'll move fast. The rest of this is going to move really fast, I think.
Yeah, it's it gives it's a different look, right? I like it a lot. I, it does need further highlights. We do need to bring it up. Especially if we want it to look a little glossy. It needs to go a little higher in the highlights. But yeah, and then, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting the eyes in. They're, they're very intensely blue right now, but we can give her more expression by getting the pupils in there. And her eyes are big enough, we can probably put a highlight inside the pupil, too. So, and I want to make her nose more pink. She needs a pink nose. My kitty had a pink nose. <laughs> But yeah, so there you go, guys. I hope you all had fun. Thank you, everybody, for stopping in. We went quite to the uh, gam gamut of discussion today on the show, as always. Um, we are working on a, a, a variety of models. So tomorrow is Living Statue Day. So I'm going to go back to working on her non-stone parts. And maybe we'll, maybe we'll do a little bit of stone stuff, too. Um, I have a lot of green work I need to do on her. So I may get that done today. There's a lot of green work on a lot of different things I need to do, actually. So maybe today will be a Patreon video and green work day. Uh, but in any case, I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your Wednesday. And uh, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Well, who have we got to raid, Justin? Just Isis. All righty. It's just Isis, but she's so cool, so you should go say hi, everybody. Thanks for coming, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you guys for hanging out with us this morning. Um, Anne was great as always. Thank you, Anne. Um, but don't forget this afternoon we have Miniatures Den, or Luca, the Italian stallion, as it were. Um, I hear tell it's his birthday. So uh, um, it's not his birthday. It's not. Uh, you guys should come hang out with us. That's at 3 p.m. Central today here in about an hour and 45 minutes. I look forward to seeing you folks then. Thank you.